This Black History Month, we're celebrating the vibrant, resilient black community in East Tennessee. We're sharing stories of the African-American experience and rich culture in our region. I love myself. I love the skin I'm in. WATE, six on your side, honoring black history, sharing our stories. This program sponsored by Patriot Home Care and Unstoppable Auto. Good evening, everyone. I'm Teresa Smith. And I'm Veronica Obey. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. We're celebrating Black History Month, taking a close look at the history, culture, and contributions of the black community here in East Tennessee. We are starting from the bottom. That's the name of a once vibrant black community just east of downtown Knoxville that was destroyed to make way for the Knoxville Civic Coliseum. It was dubbed the Urban Renewal Project, but many now consider it a time of urban removal, an entire black community community with homes, businesses, and churches was erased. A local nonprofit community center is working to bring that piece of black history back to life in Knoxville. It's fittingly named The Bottom, a space where black people can be creative, feel empowered, learn, and most of all, exist. Yeah, that's right. I took a deeper look into how The Bottom is plugging in the local black community to their past and promoting their future. To some, all they may see is a bookstore, but there's more to the story here at the bottom. And it starts with those two words, the bottom, the name of what once was a thriving black neighborhood that was demolished in the 1950s. Our founding director, Dr. Keshi el -Amin, did a lot of research and this was her passion project to kind of talk with the elders, kind of understand what that community was, the kinship that was there and that was lost through urban renewal. Um, so it was important for us to kind of reclaim that in the name and kind of stick to our roots. So the bottom was created out of that. The bookstore that operates as a community center aims to provide a space for gathering and creating. With a podcast studio, tea room, and a sewing studio, the nonprofit is providing more chances to bring the black community together without forgetting where that drive originated. Knowing what a thriving community that was, the, the network of people, the businesses, and everything that meant there was important for us to talk about, but also reclaim and share with others because I feel like often that history is not talked about. The people that live there weren't talked about. Their lives aren't mentioned. It's just property that is just destroyed and play something else. And now this version of the bottom is the voice for the voiceless, promoting change and providing comfort all in one space. The bottom is just about a place of community. I feel like often so many of us come to Knoxville and not know where we are, not know how to connect with us. And I want the bottom to be a place where it's your first stop to find your community. It's your first stop. And we not may not be the final destination, but we're a stop on the way for you to figure out where you fit here in Knoxville. The bottom also holds plenty of different events that White says she hopes provides the black community a way to connect and stay connected. For more on their events, you can head over to our website, WATE.com. We have a whole section dedicated to celebrating black history under the news tab. You can't miss the sense of pride in Appalachian culture, history, and music right here in East Tennessee. But the stories and images often paint just a portion of the people behind them. The Great Smoky Mountains is looking to preserve the legacy of the African-American experience in the park. I spoke with the park ranger leading this historic project. There are stories untold deep within these mountains. The Great Smoky Mountains National Park is currently unwrapping lost history through the African-American experiences in the Smokies Project. Just to start, the beautiful thing about Great Smoky Mountains National Park are the stories that we have. Uh, we have human vestiges back to 9,000 years. So we have stories of uh, the Eastern Band of Cherokee, early white settlers, and African Americans. Park Ranger Antoine Fletcher manages the project, helping peel back the layers to reveal the African American footprint in the mountains. There's plenty of African Americans in the region, um, but the stories after so long have kind of been whitewashed, but also just forgotten. Using records and family stories, the project is coming together. And where the records stop, technology steps in. The cemeteries tell a rich story. We're able to look at that. And, and, the, and what we do here is we use ground penetrating radar. Giving a more accurate depiction of the souls buried in the park and who they were. 
The Turner family was around since the 1800s. And with the Turner family, we just find out this rich history of, you know, um, marriages between whites and blacks during the times. But it's not just about stories of the past. One story that really helps with this is our Daniel White or Daniel, the Black Alachian White story, which was, you know, he hiked the Appalachian Trail. Again, not the first African-American, but he is one of few that hiked it. The park looking to answer so many questions for those who may not feel a connection with the Great Smoky Mountains. We also are capturing the voices of African-Americans, uh, contemporary voices through oral histories. Um, to ensure that, you know, 100 years from now, people will know about these people. Putting their experience on record. The National Park Service is encouraging more blacks and all minorities to enjoy all the park has to offer to make those new experiences happen. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. forged a path for men and women of color. Nationwide monuments, streets, and buildings have been named for the activists. WATE 6 on your side's Kristen Gallant shares how an Alcoa Community Center named for Dr. King is helping to educate and encourage the next generation of young leaders. The Martin Luther King Jr. Center sits at the corner of East Franklin Street and Moore Street. You have a majority of black people that live in the community. Miss Lily Brown has been the director since 2017. I have a lot of big plans for this place, but you know, it, it takes time and um, I want to see this place expand out and get a gym and, you know, maybe down through here, make it a nice park with pavilions and stuff. And right now, you know, we just had a standstill. The center is always expanding with new programs, but she says to continue to grow, they need more space. Currently, they offer senior classes like chair volleyball and line dancing during the day. The center also has an after-school program where they offer activities for school-age kids. Right now, they see nearly 80 kids per day. Our center is very diverse, but I have them, um, they do a chant. And um, it says, I love myself. I love the skin I'm in. Um, I love everything I do. I respect myself and I respect you too. Brown says she makes sure her kids know the history of their diverse community, a community that wasn't so diverse when she was their age. I tell them all the time, Martin Luther King paid the way for you all to have what you have today. I said, we paid the way for you all, you know, because I was at an all-black school when they closed it down and they integrated the school, and it was very, very controversial for us. From growing up in segregation to directing a community center named after a man who helped create change for those of color, Brown says she knows the impact she has on the next generation of future leaders. Women of color and women, period, that are just starting to take life by storm, politics, um, everywhere you go, businesses, is a woman running it, you know, and I think it's very, very wonderful to see people, as, I mean, women as a whole, to get out there and make a difference. In Alcoa, Kristen Gallant, WATE 6 on your side. Brown is only the second female director of the Martin Luther King Jr. Community Center. She says she relies heavily on volunteers to help run their after-school program. To get involved or find out more about upcoming events at the center, you can call them at 865-983-1954. You can't talk about culture without talking about the arts. And a Knoxville man known by the name of Stick McGee played a huge part in the world of music. You probably haven't even heard his name. But as Don Hudson reports, scholars believe McGee helped create the new sound that would eventually be called rock and roll. He had a hit in 1949, before Chuck Berry, before Elvis. In fact, it was on the charts for almost six months, and it was the number two song for four weeks. And some believe that Granville Stick McGee, who was born in Knoxville and grew up here in East Tennessee, should get more credit for changing music. If you want to get along, new artist town, buy some wine and pass it all around. The year was 1949, and Atlantic Records released Granville Stick McGee's song, Drinking Wine. It sounds to me like a rock and roll song. Historian and writer Jack Neely says the East Tennessee man had reworked a slower, profane version of a song he originally wrote in 1947. A little bit quicker tempo, a little bit more percussion uh, to it. And Neely says the new song became the first hit for Atlanta. Uh, wine, you to drink wine. Do you think that drinking wine 
is the first or one of the first rock and roll songs. It moved the, 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 uh, the chess pieces a little bit more toward rock and roll. Rock and roll or jump blues. Neely says either way, this particular song was recognized and recorded by other rock and roll artists. It did become a big hit, and uh, it became so, so big a hit that a lot of other artists, uh, 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 Wynoni Harris and other people, began performing it. Uh, 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 later, Jerry Lee Lewis uh, you know, had, a, had a hit with All them cats are drinking at one. East Tennessee guitarist, singer, songwriter may not have been well known, but Neely says he was certainly part of that first wave that would change American music. He's before most of the people we think of as the founders of rock and roll. Uh, Fast Domino and, and, uh, and Chuck Berry, all these people were later. Much of Stick McGee's life is less well known. He had just one more hit, the instrumental Tennessee Waltz Blues. And if you're a big jazz listener, you may have also heard of his brother, Brownie McGee, who became a famous blues singer and guitarist. Well, still to come, as we honor black history, he's painted the likes of Congressman John Lewis and Oprah. We'll introduce you to a UT grad making a name for himself in the world of art while sharing black culture with the nation. And have you been to Carl Cowan Park in West Knox County? The namesake has made a much larger impact on East Tennessee. Carl Cowan's significance on our region when we come back. Welcome back. If you've gone fishing or have taken your kids to the playground at Carl Cowan Park in West Knox County, do you know about its namesake? Anchor Lori Tucker finds out about the rich history of Knox County's first black assistant district attorney and the significance of Carl Cowan Park. Come to Carl Cowan Park any time of the year, whether it's warm or not, and you will see beautiful views of the Tennessee River. Also, you'll find plenty of places to catch your fill of fish. There are basketball goals, walking trails, a playground, a little something for everyone to enjoy. It was built in 1946 by county leaders as a park for its black citizens. At first, some people living in the area put up a fight. There were people in that area homeowners who said that park will devalue our property and they got an injunction against building the park but it was dissolved so that, that the park could move forward. Community leader Bob Booker remembers enjoying the park sitting on these rocks as a young man listening to his transistor radio learning more in later years about the man the park was named for. We found lots of photos and stories about Carl Cowan in these scrapbooks at Beck Cultural Exchange Center. He was a 1925 graduate of Knoxville College who became a football coach at what was then known as Knoxville Colored High School. He then went to law school and in the 1950s became Knox County's first African-American district attorney general. Cowan helped lead the way to desegregate most of the school systems in East Tennessee, risking his career. And he did did that while he was the assistant district attorney and there were people who opposed to his work in that field and tried to get him fired but the district attorney said he was, he's a valuable man I'm not gonna let him go in the meantime the park over the years continued to grow just last fall, we showed you the latest move to replace the original 15-year-old splash pad. It'll be ready for kids soon. And here's hoping they take note of the name Carl Cowan and realize what he did for generations of kids and his community. At Carl Cowan Park in West Knox County, Lori Tucker, WATE, 6 on your side. You can't talk about Knoxville's black history without mentioning Cal Johnson. Born into slavery in the 1840s, Johnson went on to become one of the area's most successful businessmen. But it was his love and knowledge of horses that led to one of his biggest contributions to the city. WATE's Bo Williams has more on this forgotten landmark. Have you ever wondered how a street got its name? What's the story, say, behind Holston Drive? What about Grant Street? or Emory Place. And then there's Speedway Circle in East Knoxville. The name, unique, as is the story behind it. I love it because for many years, people, myself included, uh, knew that this street was called Speedway Circle. We knew it went in a circle <laughs> and there were houses on it, but no idea why. That question of why can be answered with this picture. 
taken in 1915 of Knoxville's only horse race track, a track that has since been paved over but can still be found in Knoxville's Burlington community. So to find out that it was because it was his racetrack is just really extraordinary um, and that they're living on, a, on what was really his racetrack. Reverend Renee Kessler is the president of the Beck Cultural Exchange Center. It's a sacred ground, if you will, and uh, exciting to know that that's exactly where that was. The track, the creation of Cal Johnson, building the track to bring entertainment to the city. He loved horses, and so hence the horse race uh, racing and the racetrack. But as we learn, that track would bring more than just horse racing to Knoxville. The very first plane that ever landed or took off in Knoxville did so from the Cal Johnson racetrack. You know whose plane it was? Who's that? It was the Wright Brothers. A moment captured in this photograph, which now resides at the Beck Center. It's like he created... He invested in something that he knew would still be here, that we'd be still talking about, and that would have so much, um, have its roots right here in this community. And that brings us back to the origins of a street's name, in this case, Speedway Circle. For many, it's just a street, but for those that know the history, it's a symbol of success for a man who overcame insurmountable odds and brought enjoyment to all in the city he loved. Bo Williams, WATE, six on your side. Along with the racetrack, Johnson owned a number of saloons in Knoxville. He has also been linked to building one of the city's first grocery stores and movie houses. While still to come as we honor black history, comfort food made with heart and soul. I'll feed your mind with the history behind soul food and how it's influenced American culture. Welcome back. Soul food has been a part of the lives of black people for hundreds of years, but has since gained popularity as an ethnic cuisine that is now enjoyed all over the U.S. And today I'm feeding your mind with the history behind soul food and how it's influenced American culture. It's going to change your life. But to the black community, soul food is not only flavorful, it tells their story. Assistant professor of history and Africana studies at the University of Tennessee, Robert Bland, he defines it as African American food rooted in the black southern diet and has ties to slavery. Making do with kind of the leftover ingredients, so I kind of where we kind of see things like chitlins, um, the things like bacon, um, kind of those are not kind of the prime cuts, right? Those are not the kind of ideal portions that um, white families are feeding themselves. Those were um, enslaved families feeding themselves to survive. Many can attest to writing their own chapter about their relationship with soul food. Like Henry McGowan, who was born near Memphis and soon found himself in East Tennessee as the owner and operator of Holy Sold Soul Food. From my standpoint, it was the best food because you didn't have a choice when I was coming up. Either you ate what you had or you wish you had it. <laughs> now he's turning his soul food memories into tasteful opportunities for people to not only enjoy, but to understand the result of its creation. It brought and still brings black families together. When I was coming up, there was a couple of generations in one household, a little less money and even less food, but there was unity and there was love. And soul food gives you a real good definition of where I came from. Over time, soul food has developed and now families everywhere savor the many flavors and styles of the African-American cuisine. Soul food in many ways becomes Southern food, whether we're talking about um, Golden Corral or Paula Dean, we shouldn't lose sight of its deep roots in, in black culture and black history. A new spin on soul food is also now gaining popularity. Vegan options are now being added to the menu at Holy Sold Soul Food. And they're not the only Knoxville restaurant embracing a healthier take on comfort food. Kianga's Kitchen, a fully vegan soul food joint, just opened up inside the old city's Marvel City Market. Our definition of vegan soul food isn't the typical southern slash urban soul food that people would think of. Um, we, we take, or our take on soul food is food that actually nurtures your body and soul. The menu incorporates southern and international cuisine, removing less healthy ingredients like red meats and pork, and putting an emphasis on fresh, homemade foods without skimping on those delicious herbs and spices. Portraits are more than just a face captured on canvas. They are used to give us insight on the subject being portrayed and also capture historical figures. A UT grad and portrait artist is making a name for himself, capturing the likeness of some of the biggest names in black culture and beyond. 
Portrait artist Carl Hess II stood out amongst his peers at a young age. When I was in elementary school, my art teacher actually uh, recognized that there was a difference between me and my classmates, and she was able to just really pull that out of me. I first met Carl in 2009 at the University of Tennessee when he presented famed film director Spike Lee with a portrait. He says UT is where he learned to network, charting a path to becoming a professional artist. And when I presented to Spike Lee, it was just a great opportunity again just from people who had believed in me and invested in me and wanted me to be a part of that historical moment. The Memphis native has grown quite the career, immortalizing some of the biggest names in Hollywood and politics. Um, I've just been really blessed to connect with people such as um, John Lewis, Cicely Tyson, Bishop Jakes, Tyler Perry, Oprah, uh, Pat Summit. I mean, the list goes on and on. Just last year, he was commissioned to create portraits for the Tyler Perry Studios in Atlanta. But this rendering of Lady Ball's head coach, Pat Summit holds a special place in his heart. It became just really a surreal opportunity for me. I remember going to her house and bringing the original painting to her. And she was just overwhelmed that she was extremely grateful. She was accommodating to allow me to come into her home. I was just so proud to see that painting sitting over her couch and just being a stable piece in my career. For Hess, the future is bright and documented one painting at a time. Thank you for joining us as we honor black history here in East Tennessee and across the country. For more stories on resilience, creativity, and success in the black community, you can head over to our website, that's wate.com. We have a special section dedicated to honoring black history under the news tab.